Hey, welcome to our second press conference. This is um, the update from Gail Crater, results from the Mars rover Curiosity. And, and a little uh, side note here, we were having a little problem with the wireless here in the press conference room. Um, so uh, look for the, in this room, look for the wireless network that says press conference. The password's the same as in the press room. Okay, so our speakers in this order of appearance. John Grotzinger, project scientist for Curiosity, California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. Joel Hurowitz, Curiosity Science team member at Stony Brook University in Stony Brook, New York. Jennifer Eigenbrode, participating scientist for Curiosity at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Laurel, Maryland. Robert Wimmer Schweingruber, He's co-investigator for radiation assessment detector on Curiosity. He's with Christian Albrecht's University in Kiel, Germany. And Kenneth Farley is a participating scientist for Curiosity at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. Um, there are um, six papers that are coming out in the journal Science today uh, related to this press conference, and the embargo just lifted at 9 o'clock. Great. Thanks, Peter. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you all today uh, about some of our results that come from the Yellowknife Bay campaign where we drilled two holes and analyzed rocks, as well as the environmental monitoring that we have done. Uh, as Peter said, those six papers have been published today, and uh, per science policy, there are referrer links uh, that will be posted uh, by the end of today, and those will give you access to the, to the paper if you wish to download it and, and read them. And you can see Guy Webster, he'll, he'll have that information uh, as they become available. Okay, so for us with these six papers, uh, it leads to the, the question about what wraps all this together. And I would say that as my colleagues go along and present their results today, that really what we're doing in the mission is turning the corner from a, a mission which is dedicated to the search for habitable environments to a mission that is now dedicated to the search for that subset of habitable environments which also preserves organic carbon. And that's the, that's the step we need to take as we explore for evidence of life on, on Mars. So just to recap uh, what we talked about back in March, because I know many of you will be interested to know what, what's new uh, in the papers that wasn't present that we talked about back in March. Let me just start quickly with uh, the John Klein drill hole. This was the first hole drilled on, the, on another planet by a robot. And, and with this, we announced the discovery of a habitable environment, which is one that includes water, uh, nutrients for uh, microorganism metabolism, as well as a source for energy to drive that, that metabolism. And so we particularly appealed to chemolitha autotrophy, where simple microorganisms can harvest the energy that's available in the, in the minerals and chemical compounds that, that we observe there. At the time, we interpreted the environment to have been a lake. This drill hole goes through the sheep bed mudstone, which we uh, interpret to be the floor of a lake. But really what we've come to appreciate is that this is a habitable system of, of environments that includes the lake, the associated streams, and at times when the lake was dry, uh, the groundwater environment for which we have multiple signs of evidence for. And this environment, uh, we reported, was neutral in pH uh, by virtue of the discovery of the clay minerals. It was one that was low in salinity because we measure very little salt associated with this mudstone. And it was also one that had minerals in different oxidation state, which is essential for uh, microbial metabolism in, involving chemolithotrophy. Okay, so in terms of the, of the new results that we've got, just to summarize quickly, and uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues, if we go to the next slide, uh, we see the Yellowknife Bay Formation, which is the name that we give to this series of rocks that you can see in the view here, with the location of the two drill holes. Uh, the first major conclusion that we have not reported before is that we believe the clays formed in situ in this ancient lake environment or in the sediments that were shallowly buried just below it, and Joel will talk about that later, but that's significant because these are relatively young rocks in Martian history. And going into the mission, I think many of us had expected that the, the real era of clay on Mars was the Noachian period, and it was uncertain whether or not clays that you would observe in younger rocks 
would have formed in those younger rocks rather than have been transported from older rocks uh, only arriving at the site of deposition. So that's important. Uh, Jen will report on the discovery of nitrogen that would have been available to microorganisms in addition to an update on the, the prospects for organic carbon having been present there, which is important. And uh, one of the things that we also want to emphasize, again, is not just the young age of these clays and the habitable environment, but also is the considerable amount of time that they represent. So if you allow for the fact that during the dry periods when the lake may not have been present, that there could have been a groundwater system, the geological context of all these rocks, there is obviously material below these outcrops, and we know there was rock above these outcrops because we see fractures exposed in the rocks, which means the, rock, the fractures must have been de developed at some depth of burial. So by a fairly simple geological uh, interpolation, we can assume that these rocks probably were once tens of meters to maybe even hundreds of meters of, uh, thick, and that they therefore represent on the order of millions to even tens of millions of years of time, uh, which is quite a long window of habitability uh, that we're excited to report. And so in, in terms of the lake environment, this is the sort of the conservative view that, that we would propose, where based on our mapping, uh, this would be the extent perhaps of the sheep bed mudstone. We can't trace those rocks further than these limits. They could have extended beyond this. Uh, the simple concept here is that Mount Sharp was in existence when this, when this lake had formed, and water is pooling up in the lowest topographic depression that's formed between the crater rim and Mount Sharp with the water delivered uh, from the crater rim, transported down into the basin where it accumulated there. Now, if these rocks, in fact, were older, uh, it could have been that the lake was much more expansive if they represent, for example, the oldest layers at Mount Sharp, and we're just not sure about that yet. So this is our preferred conservative interpretation for the time being. Okay, we'll segue in the briefing, and, and, and Bob and Ken will talk about the importance of radiation for preserving organic matter, and then uh, we'll come around to that at the end to summarize it. But this issue about finding a habitable environment is not exactly the same thing as finding organics. There's a separate and additional set of challenges there, and we're getting very important information now on how to purposely search for these difficult to find materials. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Joel. Okay. Great, thanks very much, John. Um, can we advance to my first slide, please? Okay, uh, so uh, one of the things that I uh, had wanted to talk to you all about uh, here uh, was some of the fascinating pictures that we're getting down of the rocks of Yellowknife Bay uh, during our exploration of this region uh, using the Mali and, and MassCam uh, imagers on board MSL. And, and really what we're seeing is just a, a huge diversity of, of rock types uh, from the fine-grained massive mudstones that we drilled into uh, down at Sheep Bed uh, through to the sort of medium-grained uh, sandstones that we see at Gillespie Lake all the way up to the cross-bedded sandstones at Shaler. And what these rock textures are, are telling us is a, a story about deposition uh, and transport and flowing and standing liquid water. Okay. And after those rocks were deposited by this flowing and standing li liquid water, we're seeing an overprint of an additional type of texture that we call diagenetic textures. And it's really well represented uh, by the image from uh, Point Lake, where we see these sort of enigmatic faceted nodules. These seem to be features that are formed uh, after these rocks are deposited, while water and rock continue to uh, interact with one another after deposition. But we can go a level beneath uh, this exploration uh, with images and, and use our chemical and mineralogical tools that we have on board uh, Curiosity to tell us something more about the history of these rocks. And so what I'd like to do first is tell you a little bit about the chemistry of the rocks of Yellowknife Bay. And what was kind of interesting to us is that we found when we looked at the bulk chemical compositions of these rocks with the instrument on our arm, the APXS instrument, and the instrument up on the mast, the ChemCam instrument, that these rocks don't really tell us a whole lot about the history of, of water uh, as recorded by their bulk chemical compositions. 
in fact from a bulk chemical point of view these rocks look like they could have been extruded from a volcano just yesterday it's kind of an interesting uh, puzzle I guess you could say that's a good thing in one sense the chemical compositions of these rocks are actually telling us something about the sources of the rocks the stuff that that they came from and and what it's telling us is that they're made up of a mixture of two types of volcanic rock one of them is the kind of everyday average basalt that we see uh, all over the Martian surface. And the other component in, in this mixture is something that brings uh, uh, quite a bit of potassium into the system. It's likely coming from what we would on Earth call uh, an alkaline igneous volcanic source. And so these rocks are faithfully recording this mixture of two components that are being shed off of the rim of Gale Crater, eroded and deposited to form the sedimentary rocks that we see today. But yet we're still left with this puzzle. We have rock textures that tell us a water story and bulk chemical compositions that tell us kind of a volcanic story. And so uh, it really wasn't until we got mineralogical data down on these rocks that everything really started to come together. So if you could advance to my next slide, please. So based on the bulk chemical compositions of these rocks, uh, you could have been forgiven for predicting before we uh, ingested the, the sheep bed mudstone samples that the minerals in these rocks would look no different than the sort of dry volcanic Martian soil that we scooped and analyzed back at Rock Nest earlier on in the mission. But what we found was something completely different from that, and as you've probably uh, heard of, uh, we see an abundance of clay minerals in these Martian mudstones along with a bunch of other mineral phases that can really only form when fresh neutral pH waters interact with volcanic minerals to form these phases. Uh, and so now we have uh, sort of a complete uh, picture of the, of, the, of the story coming together which is that we have rock textures and rock minerals that are telling us something about liquid water and rock chemistry that's telling us something about the sources of these rocks. And you kind of ask the question, well, how can that be? We think from a, from a process perspective, what this is telling us is something about the, the climate in the source regions of these rocks where they started out life. What we think it's telling us is that the climate there was likely pretty dry or pretty cold or maybe a little bit of both so that not much was happening to change the bulk chemical compositions of these rocks while they were sitting around waiting to be turned into sedimentary rock. Then they were eroded and transported and brought to Yellowknife Bay and there they sat with the water that they were transported with and that's where all that geochemical action took place to turn those volcanic minerals into the clays and other interesting phases that we see today. And so with that, um, I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to my colleague, Jen Eigenbrode, to tell us a little bit about the chemistry of these rocks from the SAM instruments perspective. Great. Thanks, Joel. All right, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, rock powders from the sheep ebb mudstone were delivered to the science analysis at Mars uh, instrument, and those include samples from uh, John Klein as well as Cumberland. Now, when the samples enter into the SAM instrument, they... Uh, are heated in an oven, and then the gases that are formed are then sent to the mass spectrometer where we detect them. Next slide, please. One of the, one of the features that we saw in a lot of our data was a high temperature water signal. This uh, arises over uh, 500 degrees Celsius. And what that tells us is that minerals are going through dehydroxylation. What does that mean? Well, if you look at this slide and you see the green dots within the smectite clay mineral structure, those green dots are the oxygen and hydrogen groups, and they are being thermally uh, uh, excavated, or they're, getting, they're being uh, thermally removed from the structure. What it tells us is that these clay minerals, which are producing the high water signal, uh, we can take that water signal and we can quantify it, and it tells us that about 20% of the sample that we're looking at is clay mineral. Now you may ask, why, why is this important? Well, if you look at these structures, and you see I, I tried to make boxes here to show that they are actual layered minerals. There's a huge amount of surface area to clay minerals. And it's an active component. Organic molecules actually bind to the surfaces of clay minerals. And so the formation of clay minerals in situ, in the sediments, and the possible presence of organics uh, tell us that these samples, this mudstone, would have been a good place for organic matter preservation. 
when we, type, when we refer to this type of preservation, we're referring to preservation over geological timescales. We see this on Earth. Now, aside from this uh, slide here, one of the other observations that uh, this, uh, we made from the SAM observations, um, and as well as Kemen, was the detection of sulfides. Sulfides are also important because they aid organic matter preservation as well. Sulfides also tell us that there was an energy source in the Yellowknife Bay environment. Next slide, please. Let's move on to some chemistry. What I am showing here is the evolution of some gases from these samples over the course of uh, a temperature range. You can see in green oxygen coming off as well as in red the hydrochloric acid. The presence of these two volatiles tell us that we have oxychlorine compounds present, something along the lines of perchlorate. The presence of carbon dioxide that evolves around the same time tells us that there's a good possibility that we may have combusted organic molecules. We know that the terrestrial organic molecules that are part of the SAM instrument, when mixed with oxychlorine compounds, do combust. However, because we see orders of magnitude more carbon dioxide in this sample than what we can explain from what's in the SAM instrument, it tells us that some of this carbon, I shouldn't say some, most, most of this carbon is actually Martian. What we don't know is if it's in a mineral, organic, or both forms in the Martian samples. In addition to the carbon dioxide, we see nitric oxide. The nitric oxide is uh, also possible from some of the terrestrial components in the SAM instrument. However, again, there is not enough material in the SAM instrument to explain the, the nitric oxide signal that we see. Therefore, the nitrogen is also largely representing part of some, a nitrogen in the Martian sample. So we have evidence of carbon and nitrogen in the sheep bed mudstone. This is really important because carbon and nitrogen are required by all life forms. And it tells us that the Yellowknife Bay environment had carbon and nitrogen present. Therefore, if it could have supported life. This is also the first detection of nitrogen in a Martian rock um, detected in situ. Let's move on to organics. <laughs> now, um, the uh, SAM instrument has detected chloromethanes. Chloromethanes are car single carbon molecules that have hydrogen and chlorine on them. We know that the chloromethanes can be formed from the terrestrial organics in the SAM instrument. Uh, and, but there is a possibility that some of the chloromethanes may also be Martian. What is not reported in the current science papers that I want to tell you about is the detection of dichloropropane and chlorobenzene in these samples. The source of those molecules is still under investigation. So we have a tentative detection of carbon and nitrogen that tell us about the habitability of, of the uh, Yellowknife Bay environment. And in this big picture, we also have evidence of minerals that tell us that we had a good chance of preserving organics if they were deposited in the Yellowknife Bay sediments to begin with. Even if life wasn't around, the catchment of the Yellowknife Bay environment was an excellent place to collect non-biological organics from geological sources as well as meteoritic sources. So then you may ask, well, why haven't we detected more organics? The key to all of this is that we can preserve organics over billions of years of time. But once you expose the rocks at the surface, they are subjected to cosmic ray irradiation. And that irradiation does things to molecules. It can break bonds. It also produces free radicals and oxidants. Those end up either altering or destroying organic molecules. And so this is the process that we now have to explore on Mars, and we need to understand how might it have transformed the organics that were present, present during deposition. And on that note, I'll pass it over to Bill. Bob. Sorry. Thanks, Jen. This radiation, which Jen just alluded to, is being measured by the radiation assessment detector RAD on the surface of Mars. 
There are two sources. One is galactic cosmic rays and one is solar energetic particle events. The particle events are circled in red here. So far, we've seen mainly, nearly exclusively, galactic cosmic rays, which show a remarkable variability, which you can see here. The broad line which you see down there is not because we would measure badly, we actually measure very well. It, cons it consists, consists of lots of little wiggles, which are daily variations, day to night variations. The atmosphere turns thicker and thinner and provides more or less shielding. We also see sudden drops around day 50, around day 200, which are due to additional magnetic shielding provided uh, by solar-driven coronal mass ejections as they pass by Mars. And overlying all of this is a slow variation, a seasonal variation, as, Mars, uh, as the Martian atmosphere thickens and thins over the Martian season. Now, the big unknown to the total dose uh, are the solar particle events. And so far, we've seen one we would have expected in these 300 sols to see between 5 and 10. That's what we would have seen one solar cycle ago. The sun right now is in a very unusual solar maximum, solar activity maximum. Uh, it's the uh, weakest in the space age, and we don't really understand why. What we do know we can see on the next slide, and that is the radiation exposure that astronauts would have if they were on a mission to Mars. To do that, you need to get to Mars, you need to be on Mars, and you need to get back from Mars. And it turns out that the three phases give you roughly the same amount of dose. It's roughly 320, 330 uh, millisievert per phase, adding up to roughly one sievert or 1,000 millisieverts of dose for an astronaut on such a mission to Mars. What is that? Well, you can compare that with the dose you receive uh, in half a year of ISS. So if you're up on the ISS for half a year, that you get roughly 100, a bit less than 100 millisievert. A CT scan is something like 8 millisieverts. That's just to put this into context. Now, in the larger context of MSL, next slide, our measurements provide an additional anchor point in the interpretation of Jen's and later on Ken's results. Our measurements show at the surface a dose rate of 76 milligrays per year. Uh, models so far had shown 50 to 150, so we have a, a measurement point here which reduces uncertainties considerably. Our measurements show that the um, organics which Jen just discussed could be preserved at a depth of one meter. Even life could possibly, if it existed, survive at a depth of roughly one meter on Mars. It also shows us that as radiation penetrates into the soil, you see that on the right-hand side of the view graph, it first reaches a maximum because it produces secondary particles, and then, it's, then it decays and reaches the natural background at a depth of roughly three meters. Now, in the top surface layers, the four to five centimeters which MSL can uh, drill into, you would, with this radiation, reduce the preserved organics by a factor of roughly 1,000 over about 650 million years. So if you want to find organics, you need to find places where it hasn't been exposed for such a long time. And how that can be done is something which Ken will now explain. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, I'm going to be reporting the uh, first radiometric and surface exposure age measurements um, ever made on another planet. Uh, the team is very excited about this capability uh, because uh, determining ages is a, is a really critical part of geology. It's part, part of a, establishing geologic history and also uh, determining rates of processes. So the ability to make this kind of measurement uh, is really very important for us. And I'm going to describe two different kinds of measurements, uh, one of which will be familiar is the idea of a, a formation age of minerals, and the other, if I could have the first slide, uh, is uh, in reference to a surface exposure age which has to do with the Yellowknife Bay outcrop. So it's a geomorphic age as opposed to a formation age. The next slide. 
So what we did is we analyzed the sheet bed mudstone. We used the Cumberland uh, 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 drill core, a uh, drill um, powder. We measured the chemical composition of the uh, rock with the APXS instrument. We used the SAM instrument to measure the noble gases, which are produced by the, the uh, radioactive decay and also by cosmic ray exposure. And then we got a mass estimate, which is also required from this, mostly from detailed work that was done in the test bed at JPL. Next slide. So the first thing I want to report is the potassium argon age. And I said this is a, should be a, a familiar uh, technique or is a familiar technique on Earth. It's uh, very commonly applied. It's never been done in space before. Uh, and what we obtained from this is a formation age of the minerals uh, in the rock. And the age that we get is 4.2 billion years, plus or minus about 400 million. And I want to emphasize right at the outset here that this is not the depositional age of the mudstone. This doesn't tell us when the lake was present because the minerals that are in this mudstone, as Joel was suggesting, are primarily derived from the Gale Crater Rim and the, and the highlands beyond. They've been transported to this location uh, by a, uh, a stream or a river. So uh, what we in, instead have in this age determination is a mean age of the materials in the, uh, in the headwaters. And as I've indicated on this slide, the uh, estimated age for the, for the basalts in the highlands and also for the Gale uh, impact crater are in the range from about 3.6 to 4.1. This is in very good agreement with our uh, age of about 4.2 billion plus or minus 400 million. There's complete overlap uh, among those ages. This is important because, first of all, it validates the crater counting models that were used to estimate these ages. This is an absolutely critical part of establishing Mars history is to have uh, uh, age determinations from crater counting, and, and this measurement for the first time actually confirms that those are valid. Uh, at the present time, the uncertainty that we have on this age estimate is not yet good enough to allow us to provide a new calibration for the crater counting models on Mars. Not there yet. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about something completely different. I'm going to talk about the surface exposure ages. The, uh, the idea here is that uh, the cosmic rays that Bob was referring to and also Jen was referring to, uh, they um, uh, penetrate to a depth of about three meters in rock, and on the way, they produce noble gases that we can measure. And so the kind of age that we are describing, the surface exposure age, tells us how long the rocks that you're looking at uh, were present within three meters of the surface of Mars. The age that we obtained with all three of the different isotopes that we use is about 80 million years. Uh, this is lower than the, the general expectations that we had uh, for the surface exposure age. And this uh, age has several uh, implications that I will now go through. Um, the first is the age actually informs an understanding of the mechanism by which the Yellowknife Bay outcrop is being exposed. And it's hinted at in this, in this image here, uh, we believe the process which is exposing the rocks is wind abrasion. Wind picks up sand and essentially sandblasts the rocks. And this image captures it very nicely where you see the undercutting uh, of, the, uh, of the rock where the uh, sheep bed mudstone is being sandblasted out from beneath the much harder uh, Gillespie Lake sandstone. So we believe that the, 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 the reason there's a, an active process on Mars that is exposing rock at the surface is because of wind erosion actively occurring. Uh, the next slide. We'd actually do a little bit more than that. This uh, age feeds into a model, which is shown here, for the origin of the, um, uh, the Yellowknife outcrop. This is a series of time slices that we imagine uh, would have occurred at uh, Yellowknife Bay. The upper panel shows basically a cross-section of the rock going down into Yellowknife Bay. And what's indicated in the, in the blue circle is where the Cumberland sample would have been more than 80 million years ago. It's covered by more than three meters of rock protecting it from cosmic ray irradiation. Then wind erosion in this image occurring from right to left drives the scarp, the little cliffs uh, that you see indicated in the cross-section. It drives it across the, the uh, Cumberland drill site 80 million years ago. And then the final image shows where we are today with Yellowknife Bay and the, and the Cumberland drill site well out in the, uh, 
in the flat area. What we can get from this, as the, as the diagram suggests, is a scarp retreat rate. We think the scarp is migrating at a rate of about one meter per million years. So let me turn to what the significance of this is for organic preservation. So this, this age of 80 million years is uh, not as long as one might have guessed. It suggests that there will be some organic degradation, but perhaps not extensive organic degradation. But more importantly, we now have a model, based on this, this diagram you see here, we have a model of where to look for the least cosmic ray of irradiated rock that we can get to. We simply drive to the downwind scarp and drill at the base of the, that scarp. And this model suggests if we can drill within a meter of that scarp, we might get surface exposure ages, cosmic ray doses, uh, of only about a million years. And the take-home message of that is this number compares very favorably to other kinds of strategies that you might use for getting at uh, uh, minimally cosmic ray irradiated material, such as looking for young impact craters, which would also expose material uh, to the surface, or in future missions, uh, actually bringing a drill that would allow you to drill through that. And with that, I'll turn it back to John. Great. Thanks, Ken. Uh, let me just summarize quickly by saying that, uh, as I mentioned before, we're turning the corner here from a mission that is dedicated to the search for habitable environments to one in which we, we, we deliberately search for organic carbon. Uh, there's key, there are three key parts to that problem that our team has identified and, and discussed extensively. The first two, we can really leverage our experience on Earth to, to think them through. This last one that has to do with radiation is uniquely Mars-like. There is no equivalent process on Earth that we really have to worry about. The first one is just the issue of having a signal to begin with. And on an alluvial fan, which transports material downhill, into a lake, we have a natural repository where the hydrodynamic uh, settling velocity of small grains, like organics, is predicted to fall out with other small grains like clays. So this is a place where, at first pass, you might expect to see some concentration of either geologically or meteoritically introduced organics. Second part of the problem is, and from there it's all downhill for organics. You then degrade them, and the question is, do you have anything left after billions of years? The second step is in the conversion of sediment to rock. And this is the aqueous geochemistry that goes on where you lithify the rock, and you may transform not only its chemistry, but also its mineralogy. And on Earth, we learned 100 years after Charles Darwin uh, first saw trilobites and said there must be ancestors of these organisms. Where are they? We had to wait 100 years until a paper was published in Science in 1954 by Tyler and Barghorn, who reported the first fossils, microfossils, shreds of organic carbon in a magic mineral. And that mineral is called CHERT. It's just SiO2. And with that, you had an exponential increase in the rate of discovery after that. So this issue of diagenesis and lithification of rocks is very important because without that, magic mineral, that magic window of preservation, you may not have any signal left. And after that, then now on Mars, we bring rocks back up to the surface and bombard them with radiation. And that's the one that's the least Earth-like. And so this is the one in which we've gotten the most insight from our spacecraft. I think this is a spectacular discovery, this measurement that was able to make uh, with the surface measurement. And with that now, we have a predictive scheme that we can apply as we go forward. And also, it underscores the need, and I think the success for NASA's Mars program to have iterative orbiter and landed missions. Because what you're seeing here now is orbiter data. This is high-rise data. And on the left, we have the familiar image now of Yellowknife Bay, with the red arrow showing a lower scarp created by the sheep bed Gillespie contact and an upper scarp created by the Point Lake outcrop. And as Ken was saying, we see now that these rocks represent retreat by the wind in response to modern active processes on the planet. And, and when you integrate that abrasion rate over millions of years, you get rock, rocks migrating laterally. <clears throat> About two months from now, we're, we hope to arrive at an outcrop that is currently called KMS-9, which is an intermediate waypoint. It's about halfway for us on the way to Mount Sharp. 
We don't know what the primary environment of these rocks is going to be yet. We don't know if it'll be a lake or something else. But what we can see in the high-rise image is a purple arrow that points to a lower scarp where rock has retreated from some underlying unit that we call the striated unit. And then a yellow arrow, which represents the retreat of a, uh, there's a second scarp there, and it represents the retreat of a more massive looking unit that sits above a bedded unit that's between the two arrows. So this paradigm now, we know that if we approach these scarps, our hypothesis is that we can decrease the surface exposure age by drilling right up at those edges. And then we can test that hypothesis by obtaining the surface age date. So that's our goal as we go forward here, and we think the big step for the mission that takes us closer to the search for life on Mars is being able to reduce this risk of, of radiation, uh, which is a very Mars unique process. And, uh, and with that, we'll open it up for questions. And please say your name and your affiliation. Rick Lovett, freelance. Um, that's really interesting um, and fun. Um, which I think we all think. I think I missed a step, um, and I probably missed it. But so what you're looking for are these inclusions. Um, um, that, is that what is going to preserve organics for the longer period of time? And could you restate how old, how long they can preserve within three meters of the surface if you find it? We don't know how the organics are actually going to be preserved in these rocks. We can only base that on what we have observed on Earth and, and kind of share that knowledge to uh, Mars as an analog. However, the presence of clay minerals, um, sulfides, they all suggest that the chemistry of the mineralogy itself would support the preservation. Those could be organics inside um, uh, occlusions, like you mentioned, or it may be uh, organics that are bound up to the surfaces of the clay minerals or other minerals that are present? We don't know. I think at this point we can say that they're all possibilities and this is something that we will have to explore. As far as what happens to the radiation and the organics, uh, this is a really wide open book that we haven't even, we barely started writing the pages for it. The radiation when it comes down and breaks open and breaks apart the bonds of these chemical molecules, uh, when that happens, those broken pieces of the molecule will then react with whatever it can. So if, there, if, those, if you took an organic molecule, broke it apart, and then left it to react with something, it might either react with another organic molecule or a chemical that is in its immediate environment. And when I say immediate, I'm talking about on a molecular scale. So the environment that the organics are preserved within, in addition to the amount of radiation that they re receive, will make a big difference on how the organics themselves transform. And like I said, this is an open book. We're, we're hoping to start writing the pages of it, but um, uh, how the organics actually preserved and what happens after the radiation hits them is, is something that we're gonna have to explore further. Hi, it's Joel Achenbach with the Washington Post. Um, I'll throw it, over, uh, throw it open to whoever wants to answer this. Can you describe the lake just a little bit more Exactly when was it there? How long did it exist? Describe the water a little a bit more, and it, if you could compare it to what might have existed at that time on Earth. Uh, and if you know, we could go back in time, you know, four billion years, what would we have seen there? Uh, I think, uh, the, good questions. Uh, the lake, as you saw in the image that we showed, we, we, pre we, pre we prefer to show a relatively conservative uh, aerial distribution uh, of the liquid. Uh, imagine something, an environment that would have, you might have had back on Earth out in the Basin of Range province here 10,000 years ago. Cool, cold, maybe even ice available at the time so that physical weathering dominates over ke chemical weathering, fragments particles, they get transported down the alluvial fans. Places like Death Valley would have had meters to tens of meters of water. Uh, the size of these lakes would have been you know, like the small finger lakes of upstate New York, something like that. And the important thing that we learned about the, the chemistry is that with the clay minerals forming there, we have a moderate to neutral pH. And also we know from the absence of salt in the rock, in fact the sulfur values, chlorine values are some of the lowest we've ever measured for any rocks on Mars, and this is a mudstone, a sedimentary rock. 
So that means that that lake didn't have a lot of dissolved salt in it. Uh, and then finally, we, we have the kind of chemicals and minerals that would have allowed simple uh, uh, microorganisms to, to live in that environment. So, you know, the vista that you would have seen, probably there would have been some snow, maybe ice uh, up in the mountains around the crater rim. I think the, the team feels comfortable with that colder kind of interpretation for this to limit the weathering. In terms of the age, that, that to me is one of the surprising results. Uh, all these rocks are younger than the Noachian and Hesperian boundary. If these rocks are younger than Mount Sharp, they could be hundreds of millions of years younger than the Noachian and Hesperian boundary. Uh, 3.6 billion years old, maybe 3.5. That just happens to exactly coincide with the oldest records on Earth uh, for which we have a microfossil record. So we know that by 3.6, 3.5 billion years ago, there is evidence for very simple forms of, of life. And then finally, the last point I'll make is that the way we reconstruct this, this ancient lake and system of streams and groundwater, this is really similar to an Earth environment. There's a few strange things. One of them is this thing called perchlorate. Uh, and that may not just be a problem for us detecting organics when the, we heat them up in SAM. It could be that they react with the organics when we're converting them into rock and reduce them as well. So in the future, we might like to avoid perchlorate-rich uh, environments. But otherwise, it's pretty darn similar to Earth. Was it usually liquid or usually frozen in the lake? We can't really get that specific. Uh, we know that at least at some point it was liquid. And whether or not it had an ice lid on it for the whole time or part of the time came and went, uh, you know, that's, that's something we just hope to maybe find some other discovery at some point. Hi, um, Irene Klotz with uh, Discovery Channel and um, Reuters uh, for Jennifer. Is there, um, is there anything that um, can be done like in future sample analysis that you won't be seeing uh, what, seemed, what you discussed a little bit as potential byproducts of organics in the heating um, of SAM, but could be something more direct? Um, and I guess another way of asking that question is if you could bring these two um, mud samples back to earth, would these be viable, good candidates for analysis in earth labs? And what could you do differently to sort of home in on whether there are organic materials there or not? Part of the uh, nature of how we do our analyses allows us to detect directly organic molecules that are present. But a large part of the a method that we use, we use it because it allows us to detect indirectly organic components. For instance, uh, about 85% of all natural organic matter that exists, whether it's on Earth, in a meteorite, or elsewhere, is in a, a macromolecular form. These are super large molecules, and we can't just vaporize them into a gas and study them. What happens is as we heat them, they break down into smaller components. And so we most likely, uh, if, if we continue to encounter the uh, oxychlorine compounds, that will continue to complicate direct analyses of molecules that might volatilize on their own and be detected. However, there's a possibility that we won't have oxychlorine compounds in some of our future samples. And there's also a possibility that we may detect um, organic components that come off of some of these larger molecules or even molecules that were occluded in some minerals that break down. Uh, so th there, are, there are possibilities uh, down the road that we can only guess right now what they might be. We still have the possibility that we could detect organics directly or indirectly in samples. W okay, but not at this site. Uh, at this site, no. W with what we have right now, this, uh, we're pretty much if there were organic molecules that we could detect directly, we would have detected them. And right now, all we have are the chloromethanes, the dichloropropane, and the chlorobenzene. Hi, this is this is a Scott. this is a John. Can I borrow your mic for a second? 
Hi, John, this is a question from you, uh, from someone watching on our web streaming channel, Leo Enright from Irish TV, and I apologize if you've already answered this, but there's a bit of a delay in the chat. And Leo wishes to know, um, when did the lake exist? And for a general audience, if the dinosaurs died 60 million years ago, was this 20 times longer ago, 30 times? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think in the interest of time, uh, Leo, we already went through the first part of that, and uh, dinosaurs went extinct about 100 million years ago, so, uh, you know, this is probably 50 times older than that. Uh, I, I think the, the, the key thing here is that really what, what, what we're trying to emphasize is that on a planet that teems with life, if you go back into rocks that are billions of years old and ask what remnants of life there are, uh, it is rare, rare, rare to find an actual microfossil. It is a little bit less rare to find a large organic molecule, and we call those chemofossils. And so the trick is to make sure that you have enough of the good minerals and, and as little as possible as the bad chemical compounds that will oxidize them. That's, that's the game that we're, we're now weighing in on, in addition to quantifying radiation exposure. Uh, okay, uh, Jonathan Amos from the BBC. I'm just trying to interpret uh, this figure that we have here um, and the, the red arrow in uh, Yellowknife Bay. I mean, my, my, my interpretation of that is that you drilled a few meters away from the ideal location uh, of the most recent erosion. Um, and then at KMS 9, I mean, is it your plan to drill there? Is, I mean, in order to get Ken some some stuff to, to do some, some dating on, I presume you've got to drill um, to some degree for some, of, for some parts of that, of that analysis. Um, and, uh, and, and if you could just sort of say what organics bring to the party in terms of, you've, you've already um, shown us that all the trace elements that, that microbes would, would like were there um, and that they were accessible. What, what, is, what does organics do as the, the, you know, the cherry on top of that cake? Uh, let me let me let me just uh, take take the last one first, and then uh, see if uh, Jen or others want to chime in on that. Uh, to be clear, to demonstrate the habitable environment in the paper in which we discuss the habitability, simple chemolithoautotrophs do not need organics. They need carbon dioxide, which is an abundant gas, relatively speaking, on Mars today, and we assume back then. Uh, so, you know, and the fact that the SAM instrument observes carbon and the fact that some of it might be inorganic carbon it meets, meets the, the order of the day for those kinds of organisms. The discovery of an organic molecule, a larger one, uh, of the type that Jen was referring to, whether it's biologic or abiologic, I don't think matters to us right now in terms of developing an exploration paradigm for our mission and future missions especially, because what we're trying to do is to discover the physical and chemical environment that would have allowed the preservation of any kind of organic molecule so that you can then high grade your search and purposefully zoom in on and, and try to recover those molecules and either return them to Earth for detailed laboratory study like Jim was talking about, or send another mission up there with an even more sophisticated payload. That's how it's worked for Earth. That's the reason for that 100-year gap in that story I was telling. You, you just had to come up with the right paradigm, and then people could unlock the, uh, the problem. Thank you. I don't know if, if Jen, you want to add a little more of that? Um, well, along the lines of what John just said, the simplest uh, definition for habitability, really, you just need to have the carbon, which is what we demonstrated that we do have at this environment. Uh, however, um, carbon dioxide for metabolism is a, possi a possible way of keeping microbial organisms and a community of organisms going, but those organisms will take in other types of orga organic molecules. It is both an energy source as well as a food source for those organisms, a carbon source. And so organic molecules being present are very valuable to micro microbial communities. And they also produce organic molecules. And so finding organic mo molecules could potentially be uh, extending this idea of habitability a little further, but also telling us that maybe, maybe organisms produce these. Whether they did or not, 
a key hurdle that we need to overcome is understanding how those organics may have been preserved over time, from the time they entered the rock to the time that we actually detect them. And so until we start getting over that hurdle, we may never be able to directly address whether or not there are organic biosignatures present on Mars, which is ultimately what we're after in the very, very big picture. Um, in future missions, we will probably be looking specifically for biosignatures, which includes a wide range of things, a wide range of different chemical types of signatures. However, um, the, because organics are always associated with life and, or, or, and a biosignature at some point during its creation, uh, we, we really need to uh, uh, put that as sort of like the, the main thing that we're after, and it might take a while for us to get there, but uh, hopefully we would find them. John, let me just answer the first part of your question is we are going to KMS-9 uh, with the intention in mind of drilling if, if it looks attractive. And so the, the primary facies have to be there first. If they turn out to be Aeolian sandstones, we may elect instead to keep driving. So it's, we, we have this triage, first primary environment, then diagenesis, then radiation. That's a pretty darn good target for us. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, <coughs> excuse me. I'm Dave Perlman from the San Francisco Chronicle. Could you um, explore a little bit the role of radiation, of the radiation that has now been detected in either the destruction or the formation of some of these chemo, litho, et cetera, organisms? Okay. So you're specifically asking about how the radiation affects life forms? Oh, and affects the chemicals that you have detected. Okay. All right. So what happens when you have radiation coming down um, and bombarding molecules? They could be the biomolecules of an organism or they may be sedimentary molecules yeah. from some other source, right? What happens is they, these, uh, the radiation has so much energy and mass to it that it actually breaks the bonds. Okay, so now if, it were, if it's an organism and those bonds are broken, it might hurt the organism. The organism becomes uh, less healthy, and sometimes they have mechanisms in their systems that allow them to repair that type of damage. Yeah. How quickly they accumulate damage and how quickly they re can repair it is something that we can only uh, 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 guess about. Um, you know, life has found ways of adapting to radiation environments here on Earth, but the radiation environment on Mars is unlike anything that we have on Earth. And so, therefore, we don't know if life on Mars could have ever adapted to the high levels of radiation that the surface is experiencing. Now, when you have that radiation hitting a molecule that is just in the sediment, the bond breaks and forms radicals that want to react with anything that they possibly can as quickly as they can. If there's chemicals present in the immediate vicinity of those molecules, the organic components may react with those. That could be an oxidant. That could be a sulfide. That might be another organic molecule. And so what happens is when you're under rather inert conditions, organic molecules break and then they recombine, break and recombine, break and recombine. But when you have the presence of oxidants around, you have an organic molecule breaks and then gets oxidized. Breaks again, gets oxidized, and eventually leads to its destruction. We don't know exactly what's happening in the sediments, but understanding the chemistry is going to be a fundamental part of trying to hypothesize what the story is at every single rock that we encounter. Okay, uh, I want to cheat one second. Do we have any idea of the dimensions of that lake? Go here. Yeah, so I mean, you know, there's the scale bar there. So it, you know, it could have been 50 kilometers long and uh, you know, five, five wide, something like that. You know, typical small finger lake of upstate New York, but not that deep. <laughs> yeah. You're next. Uh, Rado Jakob for uh, curiosityonmars.com. 
A question regarding the major volatiles at Cumberland uh, site. Uh, one of them was uh, hydrochloric acid. And uh, could, this, could the presence or uh, high concentration of uh, this uh, component be a proof of um, past presence of organics like chlorobenzene, maybe, or other organics? The source of the chlorobenzene and the dichloropropane is still under investigation. Um, but the uh, hydrochloric acid, I think, is that what you were referring to? Yeah. The hydrochloric acid is a secondary product from the breakdown of oxychlorine compounds. So that actually happens in the SAM oven. And it, the, the presence of that acid does not say anything about whether or not there are organics present in the sample or not. It has nothing to do with it. Did I address your, the full part of your question? Okay. Okay, we have time for just one more question, which is coming from the chat. She was asking if they answered the question. Oh, I'm, I'm, okay. This is a question for Bob. This is from Jan Hottenbach from Stars in Space magazine in Germany. Um, he'd like to know, did I understand correctly that in order to find organic molecules, you should drill at least three meters deep? How deep can Curiosity dig? Drill, excuse me. Yeah, that's, that would have been true a long time ago. We might have answered that that way, but today we know that we need to, do, that we need to drive close to a scarp, and we can then drill uh, a meter away from it, and then it was exposed, exposed for only about one million years, and then you only need to drill a few centimeters, and that's what Curiosity can do. It can drill about four to five centimeters deep. Okay, that's all thank the you. time we have for questions. Um, uh, I'm sorry we don't have more right now, but thank you very much for all participating in this. Um, you have a few minutes. You could go up and talk to the researchers if you, uh, just, just two or three minutes. Um, and our next press conference will be at 10.30. That's on snow measuring mission reaps big benefits for California. Hope you'll be there. <laughs>